We're recording. How did you? So why don't we talk about a couple of pictures. Are you done with your PowerPoint? Uh, no, these last two, just these last two I'll use now, then I'll be done, Hillary. Okay, let's get started. So the first case, and um, I'm going to do two cases of adrenal disease and uh, one case of high heel. Um, the first case is a 38-year-old woman who comes to see you. And um, she has a past history of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is an autoimmune thyroiditis. And she's been receiving thyroxin every day. She's been taking 150 micrograms. But she's been 150 micrograms. It's kind of an average higher dose. Right? And but she's coming to you because she's reporting she's increasingly tired, um, like over the last three months. And when you're talking to her, she's started to develop menstrual irregularities. Um, in the last two and a half months, she's had no menses. Her blood pressure is low. It's 90 over 50, taken several times. In the past, she's always been normal, 120 over 80. She's lost about 13 pounds since we saw her about six months ago. And something strange, her skin, she appears to be tan. But she's not been to any place you know, where she has sun exposure. So, what do you think might be going on with her? <clears throat> and how might we ask additional questions that might try and find out? She's 38. She's 38. So you know she has Hashimoto's, so she has autoimmune disease. She's getting weaker. Fire, last three months, lost the menses, her blood pressure is low, she's lost weight, but she looks tan. She's just getting old. <laughs> <laughs> so she should tell Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> How many times have you heard that though? <laughs> well, it's, it's, you know, one of the things that I but you have that maybe that whole tumor thing going on in that that um the yeah. doula that you mentioned. <clears throat> the intermediate low? Yeah. So that's a good question, you know. She, the thing that seems weird is like she has skin changes and she hasn't been exposed to the sun. So something's happening that's changing her skin. So Hillary asked, you know, is it the intermediate level of the pituitary gland? Could she be producing, you know, melanocyte stimulating hormone that's creating <coughs> skin changes? And that certainly is a possibility. So that would be part of our differential. You know, kind of maybe something in the pituitary? Yeah. Did you I did it. So what might you want to ask? Pardon? What might you want to ask? Um, I might ask like, um, what, how's your work situation? Um, how's your relationships? <clears throat> Has there been any big changes recently in your life? Has there been any deaths? Or, you know, just kind of a whole big piece of like, you know, a lot of times people go, oh, not even fine, not even fine. And then sometimes it takes a couple session to just say, oh, by the way, she's lost her period. Yeah. Yeah. Man, she's 38. Yeah. The clock is ticking. Well, she dropped 13 pounds. So 
loss and weight have also triggered the amenorrhea. Mm -hmm. would, that, would that be called secondary amenorrhea? Yes, because primary amenorrhea would be that, right. oh, well, oh. primary amenorrhea would be that the organ is not producing, you know, the um, amenorrhea. I was, I was looking to see why this reprocity issue uh, is primarily not the so okay, so if we go down, if we go down that path. But first, let's go back to the stress. Okay. So why are we going down the stress path? I find that the stress is really the result of infection. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes when people come in with some sort of symptomology, there's also another piece going on in their life um, that's somehow connected to creating, like with the menses, I think of early onset menopause, which has the, you know, sort of in that age period. Um, and I just, I just want to know what about the stress because it can really be a part of what's going on. It can be adrenals as the precursors. So we're seeing things that are affecting, you know, her cycle, we see the things that are affecting, you know, her weight, we see the affecting, so she's just kind of this endocrinological failure to some extent. And going down the stress path is really good for this is the question I, would, I was asking her, is we know she has Hashimoto, so she has an autoimmune something going on, and it's obviously getting worse. You know, so it's affected the thyroid first. Why does it affect the thyroid first? Because the thyroid is the most vascular of the endocrine organs, so if you're going to deposit AMA anywhere, it's going to hit the thyroid in the gut first, you know. And so you end up with Hashimoto's hyperthyroidism as a result of autoimmune disease there. The other endocrine organs have high blood supply, but it's less than the thyroid. It's the most vascular of them. So they're eventually going to get hit unless you control your autoimmune disease. And stress is the most common etiological factor that creates, you know, autoimmune pathologies. So manage the stress, people start to get better. I mean, that's been my experience. But what's typical for her, a typical symptom is the, the skin discoloration. The skin discoloration is very typical for Addison's disease. You know? um, so people who look tan and they've not had sun exposure, is very typical for primary adrenal failure. The primary adrenal failure in our culture is always related to autoimmune, you know, adrenal pathology. So she has high Hashimoto's thyroiditis, so she has adrenal failure as a result of autoimmune disease. Other places in the world, it's not an autoimmune disease. It's most commonly an infectious disease. In places where TB is still exists, the most common source of primary adrenal failure is tuberculosis. So if you travel to places where there still is TB, TB is the most common. In India, India. Yep. yeah, um, particularly in Central India, it's TB, it's the source of Addison's disease. How long has she been on um, thyroxine? She's been on thyroxine for 15 years. So, is it synthetic? She is on levothyroxine. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, um, synthetic hormones cause inflammation. So you're just continually exacerbating the inflammatory condition. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't know what to do. I mean, I, I understand that, but it's like, how do you, like, this is what my big question is with autoimmune and Hashimoto's, is how do you reduce that inflammation? Because again, you know, maybe her cholesterol is also high, showing that there's this, Continual call against um, hormones, but the body's not responding. So, as you say, it's going down the line, mm -hmm. failing in the other organs. There's um, many, there's many ways to get many paths to get to treat autoimmune disease. Now, the way Western medicine treats autoimmune disease is you replace the hormones that the organ is failing for without addressing the root cause, and some of, the, some of the things I read in the way I practice is that the common etiology for the development of autoimmune disease, 
between the endocrine system and the gut is that it's a disease primarily of amadentic deposition. And um, you know, so the first step is to destroy the ama, you know, and then you start, you know, treating the root cause of the autoimmune syndrome and the organ can really start to heal. Um, but then you have to kind of say, well, what is the source? Deal with what is the source of ama and stop creating ama and then burn the ama off with many different ways of burning the ama off using dietary, hot water, fasting, chikatu, and all sorts of things that we can use. So that's the first step to working to undermine the primary ideology of, of autoimmune disease and then rebuild the system, you know, through asylum. Heal it. And what um, Nancy was saying too, the stress. You know, if you go back 15 years, what happened at that time in her life that caused this? I mean, I'm under the belief that, that there is this point in a woman's life where, as you say, most women are you not know, no thyroid. I know for me, it was directly related to a very stressful event, as well as, you know, after childbirth and different things. Like the, huge shift in hormones. So to go try and go back to find out what happened in her life that was causing stress, which would inhibit digestion, which would cause the um, you know, you know, which why stress is such a huge portion. Mm -hmm. But at the point where she's at 15 years later, can you really jumpstart the thyroid to do its work again? Or as Anusha had mentioned, she had a case study yesterday where, not a case study, but studied that this particular animal didn't produce an enzyme, so now we put this in and now it works. Well, the more you put a foreign enzyme that makes the body function, that organ that used to produce it said, oh, I don't have to work anymore. So that study was just well, looking at the mechanism of okay. how this, this actually works. Like okay. if, if, if one, aspect can correct the other because that was that was the whole point of that experiment was to see are these two systems related okay. because ideally if we look at them they aren't really related there isn't a direct correlation to say this controls the other one so that was why that experiment was done to see if we fix this can it in turn control the other one? but mm -hmm. yes ideally we don't want it to come in from the outside you want to be able to support the body and fix it from you. Right. And it's, you know, and that's the big question that they're asking is how. Right, right. Yeah. So if you if you can do root cause analysis, like in this case, this woman has Addison's disease, primary adrenal failure as a result of a uh, result of an autoimmune attack on her, you know, adrenal cortex. Um, so finding out the source of AMA, treating AMA, busting it. And observing to see if her organs, you know, restart, and generally they will if you can decrease the inflammation and the source of, of source of inflammation. And one thing we one thing we don't understand is that we don't understand everything about the endocrine system. When I was an intern, and I may have told you the story, um, this is a fascinating, an interesting story, and it probably parallels what you should talk about yesterday. Is we had. A large number of men with prostate cancer that was hormonally reactive. And so we made the leap that said that if we remove their testes and remove their source of testosterone, we will allow the prostate cancer to regress. And so we did orchiectomy in 39 men, and within six months, all of them had died, and none of them had a drop in their testosterone levels. So when they did autopsies on them, what we found was that their adrenal glands had enlarged and started producing testosterone because we had removed the testes. So the body noticed that there was no testosterone anymore and found another way to make it. And so it's not a simple science, you know, unless we have an attack on an organ that would cause failure here. The body is going to try and make, you know, the, the aldosterone some way, but there is no other source. So, um, yeah, so it's complicated. Um, so going back to the root cause analysis is the best way to start, but not replacing the hormone with something exogenous. So it's really a good thing. But just a few things about Addison's disease. And you know, as we see increasing numbers of people with autoimmune disease, 
do have different degrees of Addison's disease, but the typical feature is low blood pressure, unexplained weight <coughs> loss, and darkening of the skin, particularly on creases of their body. So you look at their palmar creases, and it looks like they're, they're like tan on their palmar creases or in the wrinkles around their face, like in older people if they have wrinkles. So in the palmar creases of their hands and in the wrinkles on their faces. And they have an unusual craving for salty food. I know we always ask people, what do you crave? What do you crave? An unusual craving for salty food that's never satisfied. And that's the body looking for and rebalancing the electrolytes because that's the function of the aldosterone that's not being produced by that, by that part of the adrenal gland, which is the common etiology of Addison's disease. It's blood pressure, lack of blood pressure control and electrolyte balance. It's actually a fairly, fairly common disease in dogs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had a dog who had Addison's disease. How does that get diagnosed in a dog? Blood test. Does the fur get darker? Actually, no. What happens is some of their soft tissues, like when they don't have fur, start to darken, like other times on their bellies, you know, um, around their snouts, where they don't have a lot of fur. They lose, their skin. Weight. they lose weight, you know, they act lethargic. Uh, but interesting, notable cases. Charles Dickens had Addison's disease. Helen Reddy has Addison's disease. John F. Kennedy had Addison's disease. Eunice Kennedy, driver had Addison's disease. So it was family, family lineage, family lineage. You talked about the atrial. NAP? Yeah, and did that trigger Addison's disease? Addison's disease in our culture is autoimmune. Yeah, so it's you know related to the immune system recognizing you know the adrenal gland as foreign tissue. You know, and it's really recognizing as foreign tissue because it's coated with foreign substances that are waste products, and that's where the armor piece comes in. Yeah, same thing is true about the hyperthyroid. So this also brings that connection back between, and I don't know what it is because I haven't studied it, but I keep hearing that the thyroid adrenal, the adrenal thyroid complex or something, and they, if one's not working, obviously the other one has to kick in. And the progression, obviously the progression of this disease started most likely with the thyroid and that could be keep up the metabolism. And so along with stress and lifestyle, it kicked into the adrenals to the point where they had to they had to fail because they couldn't keep up with what they had to do. And then that's on the supposition. But is there an innate connection between those two? I mean I feel that functionally there are some similarities, you know, that the component of the hormones that are produced in the adrenal glands do control metabolism to some degree, but they act differently than the thyroid hormones. And the thyroid hormone is not produced by the adrenal gland. It's one of the you know, tropins that's not produced there. The adrenal glands can produce almost every other hormone. So if your hormones are failing in other parts of your body, the adrenal gland can say, well, I think I can make that one now. You know, and eventually they get a third out. You know, which is stress. Continued stress, continuing to get your adrenal gland to make cortisol without feedback that shuts it off, tires out the adrenal, and then eventually it fails. So is she a vegetarian? I don't know. Is a protein diet a good diet? Yeah. 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 A balanced diet. Whole foods, plant-based is the best diet for the adrenal glands. In fact, do I have So, ways to you know to support the adrenal glands, you know, adaptogenic herbs, you know, are the ones that are the most supportive of the adrenal glands. So, you know, I mean, everybody taking your ashwagandha. Ginseng. Ginseng. 
Both the adaptogenic herbs are the ones that support the adrenal glands most prominently because, you know, ashwagandha mimics the cortisol activity curve. So, here's another question. With ashwagandha, it's, it's in the nightshade family. Does that counteract the thyroid? Yeah. It's a good question. It's a delicate balance, mm -hmm. but in appropriate doses, and appropriate, I think individualize it to the, to the person. Remember, ashwagandha doesn't work according to the nightshade. Concept okay, of it right. being an inflammatory. Okay. It says it's an anti inflammatory. Just like some of the okay. other nightshade groups are okay. actually anti inflammatory. So would you go after her adrenals first? I would go after her ama first. Okay. <clears throat> and that's what we did. You know, we're dealing with getting rid of ama and building up her agni, you know, in order to destroy the ama and creating behaviors that are not continuing to and that's where we are now. And her energy is now. It's interesting, people with Addison's disease who get the discoloration, oftentimes the discoloration does not go away. Um, so they'll say, so they're permanently tanned. Could be worse. Could be worse, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. The next case is um, a 35 year old woman who's had. Uh, Recently developed high blood pressure. She doesn't know why. She eats good, avoids salt. Um, and over the last month, last several months, she's been gaining weight slowly, been very careful with her diet. She has irregular menses. Some months it's cycle is seven weeks, some months it's 14 days. The bleeding is normal. Um, she's obese. Her BMI is 36. Um, and she has that look that she's kind of like goofy, like really too much. Doesn't want to get up out of the chair at all. Her blood pressure is pretty high, it's 165 over 98. And when you examine her, she has these reddish stria on the outside edges of her abdomen. And um, they're red lines. They kind of look like stretch marks, but most stretch marks, most people are purplish. Hers are Red, like almost the color of Sharon's um, water jug there. A little bit redder than that. What? A little redder, a little redder than that. So she's 35. BMI 36, that means she's obese. Uh, 25 is the upper limit. 18 to 25 is the normal range. Below 18 is in above 25. Overweight above 30 is obese. Above 40 now is morbidly obese. So what are you thinking? Should we ask any additional questions? I actually have blood work done, like what's her blood glucose for any of has she ever had any diagnosis at this point? Of why is she coming to you? you know, mm -hmm. She's coming to me because she wants to lose weight. I met many of us get like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, I'm getting fat. I want to lose weight from an Ayurvedic perspective. I want to become a vegetarian. And that happens like at least once or twice no, a week to me. Like, I'm fat, I want to lose weight. Like, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> we'll talk about that. Um, so she wants to lose weight, but she has all these other combination of things that kind of make me scratch her head and think, something's not going right here. Yeah. She's hypertensive, um, she's very lethargic, um, she has these funny things on her belly, um, her menses are irregular, so something physiologically is going wrong. And with the menstrual irregularity, you know, the trunkal obesity, you're thinking, we're learning about the endocrine system, something is, is wrong with her. So thyroid would be, be a, a great thought, you know, like, is she hypothyroid? Um, so one thing that doesn't go with the hypothyroidism is the hypertension. Um, usually, you know, they are hypotensive, means their metabolic rate is a little lower. That would be kind of like, eh, probably not thyroid, but maybe this component, you know. Yeah, she, she says, I, I hardly eat anything and I keep gaining weight. Oh, I'm just sad. <laughs> I 
So you might want to ask her, you know, um, you know, how is she, how is her psychosocial life, you know, are there stressors in her life, you know, go back to that place, you know, um, is she depressed? Um, anyone in her family have anything that looks like this? Mm -hmm. You know, so some of family history may help have you go down one, uh, one path. Um, what's her libido like? Does she have any, um, does she complain about aches in her joints? No. Like in her knees or anything? Nope. She did have a bone density test that showed she was osteoporotic. At 35? 35. Yeah. She had it done because her mother was osteoporotic. So it's buildup of AMA? You know, I think that everything is a buildup of AMA. And her ugliness sounds like it's could be down. Yeah, I think her problem is ugly based first, okay. you know, and to try and fire up her ugly to get that going. I'm sure there's components of AMA. A physical examination, as I described, she has AMA white AMA coating on her tongue. Well, From an endocrinological perspective, mm -hmm. what we're dealing with here is Cushing's syndrome. Cushing syndrome is, you know, unusual, unexplained weight gain, high blood pressure, round, moon-like face, and they develop fat in strange parts of their body. They develop fat in between their shoulder blades, which is, you know, very typical. They develop a soft lump of fat back there. They develop red stria on the sides of their abdomen. And it's not stretch marks. Um, osteoporosis is a component depression, decreased libido, and frail skin. So they have a little tendency to bleed because their skin gets thin. So Cushing syndrome is from an overabundance of production of cholesterol, uh, cortisol. So you have too much cortisol around. And it's causing this combination of syndromes. And so, remember when we're looking at the hypothalamus, the pituitary, you know, in the production of the adrenal glands of cortisol, it could be anywhere along that path that's producing too much pro hormone that's making the output of the adrenal gland make too much cortisol, or the feedback is not getting back to the parent gland to tell it to shut off making the cortisol. The most common source, you know, of, of too much cortisol production is primary adrenal. You know, so an adrenal tumor that is producing too much cortisol. You know, secondarily, it's from the pituitary gland, you know, putting out too much ACTH. So it's primary and secondary. So Charaka says, Chapter 21, Sutrasana, chapter 21, uh, verse 21. Um, he talks about, you know, decreasing corpulence, you know, and um, when he's addressing the decreasing corpulence, he's really talking about treating Cushing's disease here. So it's a beautiful section on page 379, you know, and he says it's a combination of Bata Kapha disease um, and we want to alleviate them by doing certain reductions. So enemas that are sharp, anxious, and hot. His first, his first herb that he wants to use is guduchi, you know. And then adding musta, hantaki, ribataki, and amalaki, so adding triple essentially. Um, and he says, takra is a treatment par excellence here. And he goes on for the, some esoteric herbs, but he addresses Cushing's disease, you know, um, 
you know, for decreasing corpulence and, and healing and reducing, some degrees reducing amine, improving fat. Corpulence? Uh, excessive nutrition. <laughs> or overnutrition. Okay. It is a, it's basically stolia, which is obesity. Mm -hmm. So this person came to you and wanted to lose weight. Were they already diagnosed with Cushing? And you took it from there and you diagnosed Cushing? I sent her back to her doctor and said, you know, you need to have ACTH cortisol levels done, you know, because I think you might have Cushing's. Okay. So, um, so then she, what happened? What did they do she about that? Yeah. What, was, what was Western medicine? Yeah, it depends on which of the etiologies it was. So she had a, uh, an adrenal um, tumor that was producing cortisol. So she would have surgery to have that tumor removed. And then I haven't seen her since. But then Patricia will come back and we'll talk about healthy lifestyle and you know, balancing out. Yeah. An adrenal producing tumor. Cortisol producing tumor of the adrenal gland. Yeah. The same thing is commonly true about the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland oftentimes is, has a tumor in it that's producing too much ACTH. And there are two ways of treating that. There's chemicals that they use to destroy that part of the pituitary gland. Bromocryptine is one of the drugs that they use. And the other is they do that surgery through the sphenoid sinus to take out part of the pituitary gland. We're going to go home and look at this again in court next week and tell them how they do that first. <laughs> so, two cases of the adrenal gland one that was underproduction, one that was overproduction. Is it kind of different ways? You know, underproduction kind of shrinking, <coughs> overproduction expanding. Reflecting on the actions of the adrenal gland. Sorry, can I say, is she going to come back at some point? Do you have an appointment with this woman? Or do you no, no, no. It's just, okay. it's just, you know, patients say, I'll, I'll come back in say, a few months, have surgery, and we'll see if she comes back. So she did have an adrenal tumor? Yeah. Oh, okay. Then, is that why she's had surgery? Yeah. Have an adrenal tumor. Surgery to remove the adrenal tumor. And the last case I have for today is. Melanie, who is a 32-year-old woman um, who grew up in Sarasota, Florida, um, and about two and a half years ago moved to Green Bay, Wisconsin, and then subsequently moved to Chatham, New York. Um, and beginning when she moved to Green Bay, Wisconsin, um, for the first time in her life, you know, she would experience depression, lethargy excessive sleeping, um, she was eating much more, she gained a lot of weight, um, and she was very irritable. So seasonal affective disorder is a disorder of which of the endocrine glands essentially. Ideal gland, right? Because you know, I mean, very typical history, you know, moved from place, some place where she had adequate sunshine to a place where it's dark a lot of the time and cold, um, and then just made a lateral move, you know, and um, it has the very typical signs and symptoms of seasonal affective disorder, which, you know, is sometimes called winter blues. Um, and oftentimes it begins in the fall, and just as the seasons start to change, um, and then it's worse at the peak of when it's dark. Know, and about 500,000 Americans have suffered from seasonal affective disorder. You know, and, and it's only about 50% and, you know, effectively treated with the methodology we have to treat it. I mean, the theory is your biological clock, which you know, I showed that picture of it, you know, and the melatonin production in the pineal gland gets, you know, reduced as a result of being dark all the time. So your seasonal, your sleep pattern becomes the shot. I mean, it becomes off, you know, and you don't have adequate sleep, so you end up with irritable, you know, and, um, and at the same time, it throws off your satiety, your green, green and leptin axis, because the hypothalamus is connected that way horizontally to the pineal gland, so you eat more. Your cues, natural cues for satiety, 
um, decrease. So how would you treat her? <laughs> Stand in your picture window and absorb the sun in the middle of the day. That's what I do. You said she's she's living in New York now. Chatham, yeah. In Chatham. So she's no, she had a lot of movement, just a lot of aggravated gossip as well, mm -hmm. which exacerbates the SSS and and it's winter time. Do you they want to warm lights. her and balance her? They have light <clears throat> systems. Right. The thing about the light systems is that people buy them and they kind of put them up and they sit and they watch TV while they're on. But what you have to do is you have to look directly at them so the light goes into your eyes. And so that so when you're standing outside, you really have to be looking like at the sun, you know, basically. Um, so the light systems are better. You know, the photodynamic treatment is actually to the retina. So those light systems are really good, and you have to look at them for about 30 minutes and get right at them. You know, and so people kind of put them on, and they're like, you know. And so, you know, Doc, it's not working. You're like, well, how are you doing it? You know? What about Travis? What about Travis? Yeah, he's watching how you can. It's no question. But you have to be looking directly at it. You have to, that's what's wrong. Right. With eyes water. Yeah. What are her vitamin D levels? You know, I don't know, and that's a really good question. I mean, most people in this culture at this time of year, their vitamin, their vitamin D levels are probably the ones that are You know, and I know blood tests I do with my patients, they're always lower than that. So this is one of those questions. Why doesn't every kind of treatment disorder and decline, you know? Why is it just a few? Um, no, not always. It can be anybody that just has grown up here. And said, it's, good, it's most commonly in people who move from environments where they had a lot of light exposure to places where the light exposure is less. So people who move from Florida up north, you know, or Latin America to Alaska, you know, they experience it in a more profound way. And the way they treat it lots of times is self-medication. So people with SAD oftentimes, you know, turn to drug and alcohol, you know, as part of, and as us, you know, we can really help them through that piece, you know, counseling. But I mean, I would, I, I would approach it with, you know, natural things, obviously, like maybe the Tratica and mm -hmm. But getting them onto a rhythm where it's hard at first, but wake up super early and expose yourself to as much of watch the sun as much as possible. Tune yourself with the sun and the pattern that you're in in this this environment. And often there are people moving from those environments hole up in a house because they don't want to be out in the cold. So yeah, you have to get out. Right. <laughs> you know. So it's a tough one. Walking with you. <laughs> like are people who are whose gene pool is from near the equator, are they more susceptible to the You know, I think if you if you meet people where they are, you can always find a piece of that there. Like when I'm counseling people on managing their diet and lifestyle, one of the questions I always ask them is, you know. Let's go back four or five generations. Where are your people from? And when you engage in their activities and eat their kinds of food, how does that make you feel? And more than half the time, they'll say, I, I resonate with that food. That's where my people's migrated to from the Indus River Valley, you know, millennia ago. And for some reason, they stayed, you know, in Northern Europe, you know, or Central America. Um, and so, from a therapeutic perspective, I always ask people, like, how far back do you go? I mean, I had a woman, you know, a couple of weeks ago who was having trouble with a macrobiotic, you know, plant based diet, eating raw foods. And I said, well, your family's from Ireland. And I said, well, what do they eat? They ate mutton and potatoes. I said, well, how do you feel when you eat that? She said, I feel great. I said, so eat mutton and potatoes and stop eating the raw vegetables. And she's doing great, you know. And so, is there, you know, a cultural 
component to it? It absolutely is. You know, and part of the fun of doing Ayurveda, I think, is kind of talking, having the time to talk to people and tease that out. And they're more successful when you tease that out and you can meet people where they are rather than forcing them to be where I want them to be. And so finding out that cultural piece is really a, a big piece. And the other the interesting thing you know, Hillary was alluding to about retraining your biological clock, you know, circadian rhythms are entrainable, you know. So people who work night shifts can change their circadian rhythm so that they can be valid, provided they continue to do the same thing over and over again, you know. So it's entrainable. And so you can change it. It's not perfect, but you can retrain your system to go back into balance. And so part of her therapy is to get back to a regular sleep schedule to force herself to retrain and retrain her circadian rhythm back. You know, Western medicine would give her the light to then give her Ativan or Xanax, you know, so she would sleep at night. And so we don't want to do that. We want to retrain the body so it goes back to your space. How about that. increasing our being and really kicking up the return of fire, right? Well, that's one of the things I have here is eat clean and increase. Get those lights back on. Increase yes. the internal. And the, the, the last thing is that vitamin D therapy you know, has been shown to improve the symptom of um, seasonal infection disorder. Um, but the, the tough thing with vitamin D therapy is you, you can overdose vitamin D because it's a fat soluble vitamin. And so it's best to have someone else manage that. And maybe have a conversation with clinicians who are managing the vitamin D, you know, to work with people. In my experience, people who are in the normal range between 30 and 100 uh, milligrams per deciliter, if they're at the low end, they still feel crummy. We want people to be close to 50 to 70 on that scale for them to feel like the vitamin D is acting like a hormone to change their, um, their psyche, to make them feel good. I mean, clinicians, Western clinicians will say, okay, you're above 25 now, you're in the normal range. It's people still feel chronic. So they want to be taking a vitamin D so that they're in the range between 50 and 70. And generally, in most people of average body weight, in the wintertime, that's about 4,000 internationally a day. But that's just a gross number. And then decreasing it in summertime. And so she did respond to vitamin D therapy. She did respond to re in training her fire rhythm, and she did get a light box and does look at it and is doing a lot better. In fact, lost weight. Well, because now she's eating a lot of new noon, eating whole yeah. mass diet, you know, she's taking some good skills. So, you know. This just raises a, a greater question for me, and I think Hillary's question why does anybody in the Northeast suffer from seasonal affective? You know, is how do we identify with? our dysfunction on a psycho-spiritual level. You know, how do we connect it to it, grab it, you know, spin it, ruminate it, live it, whatever. You know, I know as Aurobindo and Maharshi said, you know, I am not that. Not that we can all dissociate ourselves and be happy when there's some, you know, endocrine dysfunction going on inside, but I've surely run across people who, who seem, you know, fine, and they come with blood work, and it's all screwed up and all over the place. It's like, how are you doing? They're like, Great, <laughs> you know. So, so I think whatever that there is a, a huge psycho spiritual component to this whole thing, where a lot of people just don't, you know, manifest anything symptomatically, feeling crappy, you know, interrupted, whatever, and but still have dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Also, like like the trifecta of being predominantly bossy and having lots of balance and bumping yourself into bossy season and if those have always been issues in your life you know around menses or childbearing or around menopause all of that would fluctuate the hormones so that this inability I mean to find that normal base so all those endocrine organs are working overtime because it's working I don't know it's just I think it's more I could be wrong because I'd love to hear others' opinions. If not everybody has it, is it mostly in predominantly 
folks and, and those that are more, you know, of, of sattvic mind because of that clarity aspect that when, when you see those subtle changes coming, then there's that, oh, you know, it can bring in some of that demonic quality that there's not enough sunshine. And, oh, I'm feeling, you know, being more sensitive versus other people not as sensitive and feel those subtle changes and, and can see the thoughts of when you see more demonic quality. Does that make sense? Well, I mean, if you think, if you think of it that way, you know, I mean, if you think of Sattva as the fulcrum and Rajas and Thomas is of either ends, you know, of your seesaw, and you're like this, and you're most Sattvic. If you're more Tomasic, you want to get your Rajas up and going so that you can be less Tomas, you know. And just from kind of a broad stroke view of that, that's a really a good way to look at it, you know, and getting your Akni fired up, you know, and all that is really getting them moving, surrounding them with people. You know that are more active and more adaptive and less responsive. But the problem is that people start going down the slippery slope. They isolate, you know, and they don't interact, and it becomes worse, worse, worse. You know, part of our therapy then is to say engagement, you know, activity, you know, um, whole foods, getting ugly fired, you know, is really important. And the the other lesson here is that. Someone comes to you in the middle of summer presenting like this. What do you think? Well, a pineal disorder is still a pineal disorder. So something is endocrinologically wrong with the pineal gland. But if they're presenting like seasonal affective disorder and it's the wrong season, you have to say, hmm, something is wrong with the primary organ rather than the exogenous influence on the organ. So, because I've seen a couple of people who had pineal stromatomas, pineal tumors, who were behaving just like they were in, in winter blues, like in July. And so it's kind of like the endocrine system is kind of quirky, but it gives you kind of interesting clues. The more you learn about it, the more you can say, hmm, well, now that makes sense because they're acting like they have seasonal affective disorder, because they do, because the pineal gland is not working. Not producing melatonin in the right way. Just yourself personally, in the past, historically doing radiological work, would you get the whole? If you if you were going to do a pineal MRI or however you do that, would you get the whole profile? All that you take all the information, all the everything from the physician, the referring physician. Oh, I'm sorry. Of course. Well, okay. So yeah, yeah. But it, it, it focuses pictures and reading it. Right. It focuses you your uh, your scrutiny. You know, to certain organ systems and certain habits, and put it together like CSI. Miami, because it's warmer. You don't have seasonal affective disorder. Okay, that's all the cases I brought. So, I think maybe want to break early or come back early. I don't know what you guys want to do. Yeah, no, because it's twelve thirty-five now. Yeah. Lunch. <laughs> lunch. <laughs> According to our biological clock, it says lunchtime. lunchtime. So, are there any questions or things you would like to do? Are you leaving this afternoon? I am. I have to go to that memorial service. Oh, yeah. I would love to stay for lunch, but I can't. Okay, we're going to break for the morning session, and I'm going to send you all an invitation for the afternoon session because uh, I want to break these up. Okay. Um, any, hey, thanks. Any, any what questions? time are we going to start again? What um, time are we going to start again? Uh, we, it's 12.30 now. Um, I'd say probably 1.45. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll try to get back. So I'll send you an invitation right away. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.